The time is now 7 o'clock, and I'm reconvening and calling to order the regular edu Board of Education meeting for Indian Prairie School District 204 on Monday, November 12, 2018. Jackie, will you please call the roll? Mr. Karubas? Here. Mr. Razak? Here. Ms. Peel? Here. Mr. Rising? Here. Ms. Deming? Here. Ms. Grover? Here. Ms. Donahue? Here. Do we have a quorum? Ms. Donahue, will you lead us in the pledge? We have several board salutes today. Ms. Deming, I'm going to begin with you. White Eagle Project Aero student wins national writing contest. The board salutes White Eagle fifth grade Project Aero student, Rachel Chen, on winning the Council for Economic Education's writing contest. Rachel beat out over 4,000 students from around the country, answering in 50 words or less, what economic advice would you give the President of the United States? <laughs> Congratulations, Rachel. That she did it in 50 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Peel. I probably could have done that in four words. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, the board salutes Anthony Tegmeyer, technology and engineering teacher at Neuqua Valley High School for being selected a 2018-19 Project Lead the Way Outstanding Teacher. He is now eligible to become a Project Lead the Way National Teacher of the Year. Congratulations on this outstanding achievement. Thank you. Mr. Rising. The board salutes Mattia Valley's Natalie Johnson on being recognized as a recipient of the 2018 Lumen Award by Lewis University College of Education. The award is presented annually to a Lewis graduate based on that individual's accomplishment, accomplishments as a professional educator, as a light in education. Recipients inspire and guide others to make a difference for their students, their families, and their communities. Congratulations, Natalie, and I saw the video and the pictures on it that our superintendent surprised her as well. It was, it was oh, really nice. knows how to do surprises. Yeah, it was, it was a really nice celebration, it looked like. Congratulations. Great, thank you, Ms. Miller. Negro Valley students take first place in Nokia Next Best Thing Mission to the Moon Challenge. The board salutes the Negro Valley student winners of the Nokia Next Best Thing Mission to the Moon Challenge. Nokia of Naperville recently partnered with TEDx Naperville in providing this research opportunity. The goal of the project was to research ways the 4G network and the moon rovers created by Nokia would sustain or improve life on the moon from an environmental and cost-effective perspective. Nikoa Valley placed first and second in the competition, and the first place team presented their research at TEDx Naperville this past weekend. Congratulations to Carrie Cahill and all those involved. Thank you. It's now time for our student representative report today. It's from Obonte Valley High School. We have Sam Jordan to share with us. Welcome, Sam. Welcome, Sam. At Wabonzi Valley Athletics, girls volleyball won the regional championship against Naperville Central but was defeated at sectionals. Wabonzi's varsity football team finished the season with a record of seven wins and four losses. The team made it to the second round in playoffs. Wabonzi's varsity boys golf team finished undefeated in conference. They earned a regional championship and placed 12th in state with junior Will Troy placing third in state. Wabonzi's winter sports are starting soon and are hoping for successful seasons. The first girls varsity basketball game is Thursday, November 15th versus Glenbard West. The boys basketball, boys basketball kicks off their season on November 20th at the Batavia Invite. An academics post-secondary night is on November 15th from 6.30 to 9 p.m. This is an event where multiple staff members present on many different possible tracks for our students to investigate for after graduation. Recently, homecoming was a huge success with the decorations being a huge hit and over 1,600 students attending. We're confident that all students had a great time in their Roaring Twenties themed dance. 
Wobanzi's fall play, Mirth and Mayhem, was October 25th through 27th, and it was a major success with a total of 43 students involved. Also, the Veterans Day Assembly was last Friday. This year's assembly showcased an interview-style message from Pablo Araya, the Judd Kendall post commander, Tom Parker, the former post commander, and WB Dean, Mr. Jacobs, who is currently a master sergeant in the Air National Guard. Our event was last Friday, as I said, and as always, created a lasting impression for our students. This year's theme was the purpose of service. Another initiative that WB has is to collect snacks for the Naperville branch of operations support our troops. This year, the student body collected over 95 boxes of snacks. This should translate into over 2,000 pounds of snack items that will create an estimated 500 snack packs for soldiers currently deployed. In upcoming events, Wabanzi Season of Giving is coming up in December. We will have a giving tree in which students can choose to donate winter essentials and student council will arrange to have it donated to Hesed House. This will take place from December 3rd through 14th. Also, in, or on November 13th and December 1st, we have PRISM. Times for the shows are 6 o'clock and 8.15 each night. Reserve your tickets soon if you plan on seeing this show because it's one of a kind. And, as always, once a warrior, always a warrior. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. It is now time for public comment for non-agenda items. If you are here to speak to an agenda item, that comment will be taken immediately prior to that item. 30 minutes is allowed for public comment, and each person is limited to three minutes. When addressing the board, we ask that you respect the confidentiality and safety of our students and school district personnel. We also ask that those addressing the board be cognizant that this is an open meeting and is available to all age groups, and as such, ask that you consider who the audience members are this evening and keep comments age appropriate. Public comment represents the voice and the opinion of the speaker. There will be no feedback from the board, from board members during the meeting, but follow-up will be provided by administrator as appropriate. We have several speakers. Our first is Grace Bukta. Grace, if you want to come up here. <clears throat> Welcome. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Abby Melbon. Grace and I switch spots. But, um, and I'm a senior at Matilla Valley High School. I'm here tonight to discuss the District 204's lack of compliance with Illinois' Learn with Dignity Act. This act went into effect on January of 2018 and requires all Illinois high schools to provide their students with free menstrual products in bathrooms. At the beginning of this school year, I set out to write an article about D204's lack of compliance with this law for my school newspaper, Matilla Media. For my interviews, I reached out to nonprofit owners, district administrators, state reps, Naperville Central's vice principal, and most importantly, students. And I quickly drew the conclusion that D204's disregard for their student body was immense. Our district's response not following the law was because of quote unquote sanitary and hygiene reasons. However, that should be the main reason that menstrual products are placed in bathrooms, to allow students with a period to feel clean. District 203 strictly enforces this law, and according to the assistant principal, there have been no issues with these products, and purchasing these products haven't affected the budget. 20% of my high school student body is from low-income families, which means that 20% of Matias students might not have the funds to purchase their own products, and legally, students shouldn't have to worry about purchasing their own products because they should be provided at school in the bathrooms. While writing my article, Matia administrators placed signs in the girls' bathroom directing students to the nurse's office if they were in need of a free menstrual product. After I published my article, the Matia nurse reached out to me to let me know that those products were for emergency situations only and that they didn't have the means to provide for all the students in need. However, despite the signs, despite the products in the nurse's office, despite all other reasons the district has mentioned as to why they're in legal compliance, they're simply not following the law. The law doesn't state that signs can be in bathrooms. It doesn't state that products can be placed in the nurse's office. It states that menstrual products must be in bathrooms. The fact of the matter is that some students aren't comfortable about talking to their teachers about their period. Some students aren't comfortable with asking the nurse for a product, and some students aren't comfortable explaining to their teachers why they were late to class because they got their period. And students don't need to be comfortable with that because they shouldn't have to worry about those conversations. Products should be placed in bathrooms where they are easily accessible and convenient. This is not a matter that must be voted on or debated or disregarded. This is simply a matter of following the law. The district expects their students to respect and obtain the integrity of the rules they provide, 
and students expect just the same from their district administrators. Implementing this law is necessary and important to allow D204 students to continue to learn with dignity. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try again with Grace. <laughs> Welcome, Grace. Good evening, members of the school board and all in attendance. My name is Grace Bukta, and I am a senior at Matia Valley High School. As a female, I get my period at least once every month. Recently, I have been subject to the lack of my school complying with the Illinois state law regarding the availability of feminine products in the women's bathrooms. While I like to say that I am one with myself, I am not in all aspects of my life. Two weeks ago, on October 30th, 2018, I got my period. Not only did it happen on that day, but it came during my sixth period government class. We were watching a movie with a worksheet that we were told would come in handy in regards to studying for our next test. As a student with a 4.1 GPA, I did not want to miss out. When I felt myself receive my monthly visitor, I asked my neighbor kindly if she had any sort of product, and she said no. I knew then that I would have to leave class to walk to the nurse, which happens to be on the opposite side of the school from my classroom, <laughs> to go get a feminine product. And not to mention, my teacher only gives out three passes out to anywhere in the school during the semester. And due to one other trip to the nurse for the same occurrence earlier that year, I had to use another pass. When I got to the nurse, the bathroom was already occupied by another student, causing me to have to wait for them to finish before I could get what I needed. In this time, I had to give away class time and potential help for my next test, use another pass that I might need for later emergencies, and my self-respect since I had to walk down the hall praying that I did not ruin my pants, just to get a product that is supposed to be provided to my fellow females and I in the bathroom that is right down the hall from my classroom. My school is disregarding the needs for my gender and not complying to my rights and my body, making me feel overall shame and causing me to lose time for something that will help me learn. I ask of you all, for not only me, but my fellow females and other females of the district, that you make these products accessible in the bathrooms and not just in one stall, in one office, secluded from most of the classrooms in my school. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Avani Shaw. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Avni Shah. I'm a senior from Matea Valley High School here to discuss the Learn with Dignity Act. I've had my period since the end of fourth grade, and I'm a senior, so I'm going on seven and a half years. I've been in the game for a long time, and I know the drill. It's not fun. I'm usually prepared, and I can usually anticipate when I will need menstrual products. But every now and then, I have to use the restroom, and I realize that I'm not prepared. In those moments, for me to have to go back to class and request a pass to the nurse so I can get what I need, it feels mundane and ludicrous. I'm already in the bathroom. Now I have to walk all the way across the school to get products which could easily be accessible to me in the bathrooms, the location that they're gonna be used anyway. I'm wasting valuable learning time going on a wild goose chase because apparently we don't see it fit to place menstrual products in bathrooms even though that's where they're gonna end up anyway. In the seventh grade, I was diagnosed with endometriosis. It's caused my periods to be irregular, heavy, and incredibly painful. I've had the good fortune of being able to see a doctor and get taken care of. But for many students, their periods are just painful and problematic without a formal diagnosis. Times like that, it would have felt good to know that my school district would provide for me should I need them to. It's not an unreasonable request to ask that the district support students who have to deal with menstruation in the capacity that they can, as opposed to making this aspect of students' lives harder. Menstruation is not a commonly discussed subject in our schools outside of a health class. An argument against placing these products in bathrooms said that young women haven't complained to the administration about it. Respectfully, a lot of us aren't comfortable talking to our fathers about our periods, let alone male teachers and administrators. That's changing, though, as you can see by the number of girls who have stepped up today in support of the movement to make menstrual products available in the bathrooms. All of the reasons I have just described are valid, <coughs> but that doesn't matter and it shouldn't matter. Ultimately, the Learn with Dignity Act is a law, and that should be reason enough for the district to respect its students and allow them to learn with dignity. I'd also like to add that nobody's expected to bring toilet paper from home. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is Jessica Rizzi. Welcome. 
Good evening. So, I'm going to talk about a little story that I had last year. Also, my name is Jessica Rizzi. If you didn't. <laughs> um, last year, I remember I was an AP. I didn't know what to do, and I really had to use the restroom. So, I proceeded along the hallway, asked my male teacher if I could go. When I got there, I noticed, oh, I got my period. So, I then had to walk all the way back to my class to ask my male teacher to go back to the nurse to get a feminine product. Then he said, what's the emergency? So I said, oh, I just have some pain. Can I go to the nurse? He said, I need more spe specific details. I said, I got my period. I am just very confused why I have to explain to a male teacher why I got my period and what, what I need. I'm very also confused why I have to walk my way all the way back to the nurse's office when I could walk two steps to a bathroom and just get what I need and it's very frustrating when many girls also have to do this. I understand girls should be carrying their own products, but also some people can't afford their own. So thank you for listening to all of us. Thank you. I hope I don't mispronounce the next name, but Emelone Kem? I guess I mispronounced it. I think you did. Help me with your name, please. Oh, Emmeline. I know Emmeline. Yes. <laughs> you were my principal oh, yeah. in uh, elementary school. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Emmeline Kerwin, and I'm also a senior at Mateo Valley High School. Um, I also want to share my story about how this relates to me. Um, sophomore year, I was in a class called Auto Mechanics, so it was kind of like working on cars and that kind of stuff. So there were only two other girls in that class, and um, they were seniors, and I was a sophomore. They weren't very friendly with me, and they happened to not be there this day. Um, but we were sitting there doing uh, book work and I felt that I got my period unexpectedly um, and I had assumed that I had menstrual products in my backpack so I had to go up to my male teacher and lie to him as to why I had to bring my backpack with me because I wasn't comfortable telling him that I got my period. So I had to lie to him then and then I went um, out of class to the bathroom and then I realized that I was unprepared and didn't have anything. So then I was a little concerned because I didn't know what to do. So I had to sit in the bathroom and wait for another girl to come because I couldn't leave um, with how my situation was at that point. So I had to sit and wait for another girl to come in that had an extra um, tampon for me to use. Um, when I got back to class, my teacher kept asking me for an explanation and I didn't really know what to say because I was so embarrassed at, um, at what had happened. Um, the Learn With Dignity Act really would have benefited me in that situation. Um, but it wasn't in place then, but it is now. And I think it's really, really important that we need to, to adhere to, the, to this law because it's a law for a reason and District, two, District 204 needs to get on board with this. So no more girls have to go through embarrassing things like that. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is India Williams. Welcome. Hi. Good evening, everyone. I first learned about the Learn With Dignity Act after I was interviewed by Abby Melbon, in which she informed me that the district, the district has to uh, supply menstrual products in the bathroom. And I was appalled to learn that our district wasn't doing this because it doesn't even come down to the fact that it's inconvenient for girls having to ask their teachers to leave the bathroom and walk all, all the way across the school. But also, more than students use the school, I know that. Um, Besides just Matias students, you know, we have sporting events there, speech competitions. Just last week, we had our Youth and Gov mock trial. And so for other students coming into, into the school and the school being used as a public institution, I know people can probably register to vote there. It should provide menstrual products, not only just students, but other people who may come and use the school. On Sundays, I know there's a church service there. So it's not even just a matter of the inconvenience of students during the day needing to get their products, but also for everyone else who uses the building and it's a matter of respect. Thank you. Thank you. And Ellen Sweeney. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. My name is Ellen Sweeney. I'm a senior from Wabonzi Valley High School. 
Uh, and here in District 204, we pride ourselves in striving to help all students grow socially, or emotionally, and academically, to be student and community focused, and to manage resources efficiently and effectively. These are your words and not mine. They are three of IPSD's district goals for the 2018-2019 school year listed right on the Board of Education's website. So if they are so fundamental to this district, why not do everything in our power to bring such goals to fruition? Let's begin with the first goal, a promise to help all students grow socially, emotionally, and academically. I consider the illegal refusal to supply pads and tampons pretty counterintuitive given that half of your students in high schools are 14 to 18 year old girls and one part of our growing is bleeding once a month. If you really want to help us grow, you may facilitate that growth by making it that much easier to deal with the growing um, by supplying pads and tampons. In fact, you can actually kill two birds with one stone here and also help our academic growth. In the time it takes to ask for a pass to the nurse, go to the nurse, sign into the office, and ask for menstrual products, we could be in class learning instead. Now for the second goal to be student and community focused. Prior to this meeting, I reached out to my own community of girls asking for examples of any time they've needed menstrual products but not been able to go to the nurse. Here are a few of them. I remember last year during badminton season, we went to so many different schools and legitimately all of them had free pads and tampons which were free to use and it helped so much. They should be a basic necessity available everywhere for free. I bled through my pants one day during second period and had to wear a flannel around my waist until gym class because none of my teachers would let me change. Dealing with the lack of tampons made me feel unfocused in school because I was so paranoid that I was bleeding through my pants. I now go to Plainfield North and the amount of times I've gotten in a regular period and had to go check my situation is innumerable. At my school, we have panty liners and cheap tampons that do a sufficient job that can sustain me for a whole day. Sophomore year, I went to the bathroom before changing for swim and got my period. So I texted my mom and went to the nurse and they didn't offer me anything. And I just went home because I was so embarrassed and had to tell my teacher and the secretary and the nurse all about it. I once got my period and no one in class or in the bathroom had tampons, so I went to the nurse and they were out of both. Once I got my period and I wasn't ready to use tampons yet and nobody had pads, so I went to the nurse and they only had tampons and not pads. So administrators, let your students speak for themselves. All we ask is for easy access to an easy solution to a chronic disruption in our academic lives. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to our, the superintendent report and consent agenda portion. And we will begin with Dr. Sullivan. Okay, we're um, already into the second uh, quarter of the school year and only a week away from Thanksgiving break. And today and last week, our school celebrated Veterans Day with various assemblies and events, activities. I know the ones that I was able to attend were very um, moving and well done. And I know several board members were able to attend um, several of the events. I know some people got the thrill of seeing the Black Hawk helicopter land at Matia Valley. That would be Lewis. He was very excited. And I think Dr. Mr. Rising saw I, it take I off. I saw huh? it take off. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I want to thank all of the veterans and members of the armed forces who participated in the events in our schools as we honor them for their service and as we educate our students about why this is such an important day for our country. So a reminder to our parents to join us this Wednesday night um, at um, Wabonzi Valley in the auditorium from seven, uh, starting at seven o'clock for our first ever parent school safety night presentation. Some of the safety topics we're gonna include are what parents should teach their younger children to help keep them safe, uh, the district's partnership with police and how um, our school resource officers work with staff and students Alice training in our schools, our new program that involves a school safety dog, and how students and parents can re report safety concerns. So all District 204 parents are invited to attend, and students are encouraged to attend at their parents' discretion. And lastly, Thursday, November 15th, is School Board Members Day in Illinois. So I want to take the time to thank our Indian Prairie School Board members for their service to the district and the community. And being a school board member requires a sig significant um, commitment of time and energy. And I know that many of you had no idea about that commitment of time and energy when you first took the, um, this volunteer position. And there might be days that you might be questioning uh, why you made that, you signed on for that job. I'm sure not Natasha yet. Um, but we know from research that highly effective and efficient school board um, that focus on the things that matter have a positive impact on student achievement in um, this district. So I'm proud to work for a group of volunteers who are committed to being that kind of school board. And District 204 students, families, and staff are very fortunate to have you 
um, leading this great district. So I have one, I have a little gift for all of you, um, which is a, a book that I wanted to share with you all called What School Could Be. So I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about it. So <laughs> happy School Board Members Day. Thank, Thank you. you. In, in two days. <laughs> I, need, I now need a motion that the Board of Education approve consent agenda, agenda items D through H as presented. I move that the Board of Education approve consent agenda items D through H as presented. Second. I have a motion and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Jackie, please call the roll. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Rising? Aye. Ms. Peel? Aye. Mr. Carubas? Yes. Ms. Grover? Yes. Ms. Deming? Aye. Mr. Razak? Aye. Motion passes. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask the board if I have permission to move the approval of the Illinois Association of School Board Resolution and Position Statements to letter A instead of D in order that I can accommodate our audience. Is there any objection? <coughs> Hearing none then, I'm going to go to our public comment for agenda items. Again, each person is limited to three minutes. I think you just heard what I said before. I'll repeat a little bit. Public comment represents the voice and the opinion of the speaker. There will be no feedback from board members during the meeting, but follow-up will be provided by an, an, an administrator as appropriate. And with that, we have Shelly Sandstrom. Shelly, welcome. Hi, I am Shelly Sandstrom. Um, I'm a mother of two students who have made their way through District 204 very successfully, and I thank the district for their wonderful education that they've received, and they're kind of becoming awesome adults, actually. <laughs> yes. so I think that has a lot to do with the school that they went to, the schools that they went to. I'm here today to address the board about the IASB Resolution Number 2, Student Safety and Protection, um, that will be voted on at the meeting November 16th through 18th this week. Um, I'm concerned about the resolution because it does call for the IS, ISB to lobby in Springfield to allow school or for or a law that would allow school districts to arm teachers and other personnel. Um, I know the reasoning behind this is that there are some rural school districts that can't afford school resource officers or don't have school resource officers as we do and that they're concerned about a law, law enforcement reaction time in response to an active shooter situation. Um, I do understand that that is the reasoning, but I would like to make a few arguments in my three minutes um, to, to ask you to vote against this resolution or have your delegate vote against this resolution at the conference. Um, firstly, the uh, Teachers Union, the Amer American Federation of Teachers, the NEA, and the National Association of Resource Officers, Officers strongly oppose Army teachers and school staff. Additionally, Chief Robert Marshall here in Naperville opposes it as well. Um, his wife is a teacher. He has spoken to my group. I'm part of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. And uh, he has definitely indicated that he strongly opposes this as a law enforcement officer. Um, he feels that an active shooter situation is a volatile situation. It's fluid. It's something that is uh, obviously unpredictable. And for personnel that are not trained as resource officers are and as law enforcement are, it can often aggravate the situation rather than help the situation. Um, there is actually research that the present presence of a gun increases risks to children um, from unintentional and intentional shootings. It triples the risk of death of suicide and doubles the risk of death of, by homicide for children if there's a gun even just in the area. Um, a couple of examples of unintentional shootings by well-intentioned individuals. Recently in October, uh, in October in Florida, a teacher, although this is bizarre, had a gun in his waistband and did a backflip and the gun fell out of his waistband on a playground. It was an elementary school. So this was an armed teacher. I'm assuming that that's allowed in Florida. I, I didn't actually look into the law, but I'm guessing it was. Um, in March, a teacher in California discharged a weapon accidentally. Um, luckily, didn't hit anybody. There was a teacher that, uh, or a 
a, uh, I don't know if it's a teacher, but somebody, a personnel in a school that left it on a toilet tank in a bathroom and was found by students. So those are just some examples of how this can just add to the risk of uh, students and children and, and even staff being um, injured by, by firearms. So um, I am urging you to vote against um, allowing our delegate to vote for uh, resolution number two at the IAS, IASB. Um, I do know it's a local control issue is the argument, but I will argue this, that you are our school board now. I'm assuming you would not um, vote to um, allow teachers to be armed in our schools at this time, but school boards change. If there's a law that passes in Springfield that allows individual school districts to decide if they can arm teachers and personnel, you will not be on the board forever if that law is open. It's a Pandora's box Shelley. that would allow that to possibly happen in the future. And thank you for your thank time. You. Thank you so thank much. You. And Alona Rastus. Hi, Alana. Good evening, board, and good evening, students, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to reiterate what our lady just shared with us. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a parent and president of Wubanzi Valley Pages, and I want to address this proposal to arm teachers with guns. And I'd like to share a few figures with you. According to surveys done, 53% of teachers strongly oppose the proposal, and 70% believe that arming teachers would not be effective in limiting casualties in a school shooting. And I know I'm not alone in this. If you go online, you'll find incidents regarding guns. We heard some just now. There was one where a police officer was in the school talking about gun safety, and he shot himself in the foot. He said the, the gun was empty, and the next minute it went off, and he limped around for the rest. He tried to keep the students calm, so he stayed where he was and limped around to finish his presentation. Another teacher who was trained to use a gun accidentally fired it into the ceiling, he also thought the gun was empty and told the students that the gun was empty, shot it up, and part of the ceiling came down and a student got injured. On top of that, we also have what is called implicit bias. There is a situation that we are trying to get under control in our district and other places with regards to the level of punishment that African American students receive compared to their peers. This is not going to help that situation. It just takes somebody seeing a student who is loitering around to put their hands in their pockets to appear to be taking something out that they shouldn't have on them in the first place and cause action that somebody, the teacher and the student will regret. One article's title was, do you, realize coming, do you realize arming teachers is going to lead to black students getting murdered by their, teach, their teachers? This is an express, expression of fear. It's not an incriminating statement. And so it is our hope as parents, as Paige's parents, and students that the board will consider alternative measures. Very quickly, suggestions that have been put forward are enhanced mental health services, better school security, and universal background checks. Thank you for your time. Go Pages, go Warriors. Go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will now move to that action item. Board, in order to make sense of all this, I think we're going to need some separate motions just to get through this in an efficient way. So 
I would like us to consider statement five, six, seven, and eight. And I need a motion to approve the position statement of do adopt for a reaffirmation of existing position statement five, new belief statement six, and amended belief statement seven and eight. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the position statements of do adopt for reaffirmation of existing position statements number five, new belief statement number six, and amended belief statement number seven and eight as presented. Do I have a second? Second. I do have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Those are the, all the ones that are not the gun control one, right? No, that's or yours and Kathy. Yeah. Let and me, yeah. let me yeah. <laughs> share with one, so please yeah. share with So five is the position statement, 2.27 about charter school funding. Then six is the new belief statement from District 204 about local authority and safety practices. Evidence-based safety practices, <laughs> which okay. was the whole point. <laughs> yes, Mrs. Peel, thank, oh, thank you, you for helping me. <laughs> and then there's the amended belief statements, one by District 204 and student vo voter registration, and also number seven is about mental health services. You want to, I think that they're in our packets and we have them here any further discussion just want to make sure hearing none Jackie please call the roll mr. rising aye miss Peel aye mr. Rasak aye miss Grover aye miss Stemming aye Mr. Carubas? Yes. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Okay, again, in order, hopefully, to make some sense out of this, um, I think we should consider resolutions number one, which is do not adopt. Number three, do not adopt, and that's for the student safety and, and the guns. That's do not adopt. And number four, do adopt for energy savings, funding, and borrowing. I need a motion to approve the position of IASB Resolutions Committee for these new resolutions. I will make a motion for the approval of the position of the IASB Resolution Committee for new resolution one, do not adopt, number three, do not adopt, and number four, do adopt, as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Jackie, please call the roll. Mr. Rising. Aye. Ms. Peel. Aye. Mr. Carubas. Yes. Ms. Deming? Aye. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Rasek? Aye. Ms. Grover? Aye. Motion passes. Now we get to the famous number two. <laughs> um, and we should consider the motion and the position of the IASB IA Resolution Committee for new resolution number two of do adopt as presented. Do I have a motion? Uh, for discussion purposes, I will make a motion for the approval of position, uh, of the position of the IASB Resolution Committee for new resolution number two of do adopt as presented. Second. I have a motion and second. Discussion. All right, I'll start. <laughs> okay, I understand the aversion to mandates. However, there are certain areas where I believe we cannot allow free choice. Within our school districts, we require a certain level of certification and license of our teachers. Similarly, within our state, there are specific requirements for school nurses. Districts cannot choose to let teachers take a CPR class and some first aid training and act in place of a li licensed school nurse. I believe as many 
as many professional organizations involved with education and policing, that districts should not be given the option of allowing teachers to carry guns. This responsibility belongs in the hands of a professional, preferably uniform school resource officer. Districts should not be allowed to choose to make school protection another responsibility of teachers. I also understand that one of the rationales for allowing districts the option of arming teachers is the expense associated with the school resource officer. After our last discussion on this topic, I asked about the additional cost of insurance for supporting armed teachers in, our district, in a district. I received input that indicated the cost would be very expensive. Our own insurance company responded with a quote, we strongly recommend against any school implementing this practice, and went on to list the many associated reasons for this statement, which I'm not gonna go into, but Additionally, I have been told that in schools who have moved to allow teachers to carry guns, they have um, been faced with lawsuits debating the strategy and causing additional significant expense. Illinois School Board Association should not approve this position statement endorsing the ability of districts to decide whether to allow teachers to carry guns. They should instead put in place a position statement endorsing the importance of a professional school resource officer and making this a priority in district funding. I really, I mean, I strongly feel we should vote no and be very vocal at the conference in uh, vo voicing our uh, displeasure at them uh, looking at approving this. Thank you. Other Susan? Um, I strongly uh, oppose us going along with the particular um, position as it's stated. I think that we should firmly indicate that this is not something that we see as a viable option. I feel that we should share, um, just as we make decisions regarding uh, where investment needs to be, obviously safety is crucial. So for those schools, especially downstate, that have brought this, um, making an investment to ensure that they have proper school resource officers on site, uh, I feel is imperative. One of the things that uh, I took a look at from a research standpoint, looking at just the number of national associations that oppose arming students and administrators. The National Association of School Resource Officers, National Association of Secondary School Principals, National Association of Elementary School Principals, the American School Counselor Association, the School Social Work Association of America. And then, um, as already has been mentioned, in addition specifically for our district, our Naperville and Aurora Police Departments strongly oppose uh, that situation as well. From uh, a final standpoint of consideration, just looking at the potential harm that it can put students in, that it can put teachers and administrators in, is just something that I don't feel that we should at all subject our schools to. And then in addition, um, Alana mentioned earlier some of the challenges with students of color, Latino and African American students. There can be a, an, an additional potential of risk for students um, in harm's way. So I strongly want us to indicate no on this particular policy. Mr. Carubas? It's gonna pass the IASB and it's gonna die in Springfield. I'm very sympathetic to the lack of resources and local control issues and the response time that uh, we're fortunate that we've got great response time people are here immediately um, I know how this board's gonna vote on it so I can support that decision in opposition to this resolution That's all I got. Ms. Peel. Well, um, <laughs> I think if we uh, were going to vote for this resolution, we would be voting against our own resolution to support evidence-based practices for security measures. 
And um, why is that? Because there is no evidence-based measures that suggest arming teachers as a matter of defense against an active shooter. So shoot. nothing, nothing, and they've just listed every single organization who has been a part of any of the planning. So shouldn't if they if they schools have the option of developing a plan, and they I'm use evidence, sure. shouldn't they come to the same conclusion? So. What is the evidence, though? There is no evidence that this would work. There's evidence that there's a danger to it. There's not evidence that it is a viable solution. So do you not trust other school boards to, to, I, to go through I, that process and come to that same conclusion? I'm going to say no, I don't. I agree with Lori's statement that there are some things that we do need some mandates on. And, and I think this is one of them. I would agree with Kathy because if, if we could see school boards that would look at, re, um, recognize that there is no evidence, then this would not have come forward to begin with. What if it were the other way around? That they mandated arming teachers? I would be in Springfield and I would oh, be protesting my gosh. that. <laughs> And that was one of the reasons why I put our resolution up in the first place, was to get that out there in, for, in front of suggestions that we arm teachers. So we knew this would be a discussion. I didn't know it would be exact same time as ours. <laughs> um, but I thought if we have resolutions that say, speak to evidence-based practices when there are none, I mean, with all the literature that's out there, there is nowhere that suggests arming a teacher is a good idea. It's actually a danger to our students. I, I would hope every school board member would understand that and, and do their own research. But you and I sat at that committee table, and I am not sure that will happen because there were some people who felt that they could handle anything. Passed the resolution that. committee. I did. Although, I, don't, I, I disagree with you that it will for sure pass <coughs> the ISB delegates. How, how many way. people are on the resolution committee? It's, it's that. Um, There's it's one from, one from everybody every stuff. district. From the region. How many people are there? About and 50? there's yeah. 40 or so. Okay. But there's, but there's 800 and some districts, right? Yeah, I mean, there's 800 districts, and most of them are rural. I, I, I just, I think, you know, it's the House of Representatives. Is there, okay. But Justin, even, even potentially, if you feel that, that it will pass, that doesn't mean that we can't share whatever our board decides. We we need to we need to share what our board decides. Sure. Mr. Rising. So, you know, I appreciate where Mercer County District two four hundred four is coming from, where this this resolution stems from. Um, you know, I get that they're a rural district. Um, they've got one high school one intermediate school and two elementary schools, 1,300 students. They spend approximately $9,300 per student, which is about $2,000 less than we do. Um, you know, there's nothing that's more important, I don't think, to any school board member in this whole state than the safety of the kids. I mean, I don't know if you're like I am, but every time we hear about something that happens at a school throughout the country, it just eats away at me. Um, so this district that presented this resolution made a compelling argument. It takes police a long time to get there. They don't have the money to afford a, a school resource officer. But if safety is their number one priority, I question where they're focusing their resources at. Now, I understand 
districts have struggles. We all have struggles. We put off our maintenance <laughs> for many, many, many years to afford some of the things that we needed to in this district. I've got, on one hand, I, I feel like every district should make their choice. So, you know, I, I've got to believe if this were ever to get to legislature, legislature would say school districts can make their own choice on this issue. So to me, that's a wash. Then I get back to how do I feel about it? And the fact of the matter is, schools are still one of the safest places in this country. Since 1966, research is different all over, but somebody that truly wanted to do harm in a school that didn't know somebody, there's only been 13 of those incidents since 1966. There, up until last September of 2017 in Mattoon, I believe it was, where there was a, a student with a gun, the teacher stopped him before he did anything. That was the first recorded incident in Illinois since the records have been kept on this information, since I think the late 1800s. So schools in Illinois are still extremely safe. Where I've got a real problem with this is that our governing body, the Illinois Association of School Boards, if a legislator were to approach them, IASB would say, yes, our school, board, our school boards across the state want the ability to have guns. That is a dangerous precedent we, our governing body is setting for policy. And I just got a serious problem with it because you know, I say, as I said last time, you start having guns in schools, you start normalizing it even more. There's more risk of things happening, in my opinion. Um, and, and, the, and the statistics show that when there is less guns in an area, there is less gun incidents. So why do we want to put guns in schools even more? It's it just, it's counterintuitive to me. Um, so I, I will not be supporting this. Ms. Grover. So I, I understand the difficulty rural communities have, and I believe local boards should decide what's best for their children in their district. However, as several people have mentioned here, teachers, police, police officers, social workers, who know children the best oppose this resolution. Um, I think it places an additional burden on teachers in that teachers might feel pressured now to arm themselves. Who knows, maybe if they don't, they might feel that they are gonna face repercussions from the district. I think students <laughs> will feel actually more unsafe knowing that their teacher has a gun. And so I would oppose this resolution. Any other discussion? Mike. Well, I appreciate all the research that people have done. You can tell we've taken this very, very seriously. In my own mind, the position statement's ill-conceived. There is things that can and should occur prior to arming our teachers. My additional part of research was meeting with security companies. And I'm kind of convinced that even, I think our kids would be safer if we had security policies and security procedures in place much more stringent ones than even having an officer or armed teachers. I know that takes money and resources and legislation, but if we were true advocates for our students and for our schools, 
we would, our organization should be lobbying our legislators to provide that money in order to keep our students safe. It appears we went to the least common denominator and perhaps the easiest solution, which is to arm teachers. Easiest, most detrimental. Easiest and perhaps most detrimental in my mind. So I really see this as being ill-conceived. I think there's plenty of intermediate steps that could occur prior to going to such a dire recommendation so I, think I have further stuff. comment. Sure. You know, we're wrestling with this local control issue, and uh, we throw it around. Um, but if you look at 6.01 on their IASB's current position statements, it states that IASB shall take all appropriate action to encourage members of Congress, General Assembly, to refrain from introducing, supporting, or promulgating rules, regulations, which deprive local school districts of decision-making powers on matters in which there is not a clear and compelling state or national interest. That last part, not a clear and compelling state or national interest. I think that is what we are trying to wrestle with in balancing local control with the mandates and the uniformity and things like that. So I think that's a, an important aspect as we try to frame the issue moving forward. And for me, I understand the importance, and that's why I called it a policy conundrum at the last meeting. But I'm kind of with Mrs. Donahue. <laughs> there's times when local control, there's something more important than local control, and this is one of those times. Other, as a, as a point of clarification, a yes vote means that you want to adopt the resolution. A no vote means that you're opposed to the re resolution. And the recommendation from IASB is do adopt. Jackie, call the roll. Mr. Rising? No. Ms. Stemming? No. Ms. Donahue? No. Ms. Strong? No. <laughs> Mr. Karubas? No. Mr. Rasak? No. Ms. Grover? No. Ms. Peel? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Motion fails. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a question. So, does do you have an opportunity to speak? On I the if uh, I was going to ask that later, but I can ask it now. If if the board would like to me to make a statement, I have before on behalf of our board. I'd be more than happy to. I, I can take some of what was said tonight. I made some notes and. Um, you know, uh, if there's something specific you'd like me to say or something very short and sweet you'd like me to say. They don't give you much time. They give you about 20 seconds, you okay. know. So, but but I can be pretty impactful in 20 seconds. I, th I, think, we, you can. I think we should focus on the positions that we're trying to advance during this I, session. Yeah. I mean, I well, but asked, chances are those will come asked. up for discussion, Justin, is my guess. That'd be good. That'd be but, good. but no, I, I would like to see ours, ours definitely uh, pass, our two pass. Just um, a question. You know, I, I I found some additional information out as I was researching this that in advancement of the resolution committee meeting on Saturday, I will be sharing with IASB, and I may even I may even out of my own pocket make copies of what I found and put it on all the school board members' chairs before they get there. About but, what? Um, where this has actually stemmed from. Where, 
where the words come from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was an article written back, uh, we all are familiar with the uh, Illinois School News. Jim Broadway. Um, yeah, Jim Broadway. And um, he said that, you know, he that he felt that there was a, a, a push to arm educators in Illinois coming from an NRA affiliated group called Illinois Carry. But rather than testify about their idea openly in legislative hearing, they want IASB to lobby, a lobbyist to do it. So there's thinking that, you know, school board member brought it up in, in Mercer District and so. I would be careful about taking political stances. I, I know. So. No, yeah, no, I wouldn't. But I, I will just stick we, to the arguments. The I will stick to the arguments that we made as a board. I prefer not that not to to be distributed. No, I won't. I I would prefer you to speak up with a position though on this gun thing. I mean, honestly, I would give up my position statement to make sure that we put in a good word on this. That I mean, I I just feel that strongly that this is. Not something that we the IASB should be taking a position on. Well, and, and there may be a later discussion as well. Uh, Mike and I have had conversations about, with us being such a large school district, should there be dis vote. should there be discuss <laughs> should there be discussion that our vote we carries more vote. weight in the state? I mean, I know we are all individual boards, but at the same time, you know, we pay dues and. We have some big dues, so well, we can discuss that later. It's not going to change. It. But yeah, normally, he, I don't think we have to trade our resolution no, for it. Kind of sounded, <laughs> kind of, no, but it kind of sounded like we needed to make a choice: do we defend our ones that we're presenting, or do we attack this thing? Right? That's kind yeah. of what I heard, and I'm like. Well, really, if that's a choice, I, I really don't think anybody's going to really attack the one I no. propose. And I'm not sure about yours, Kathy, but I doubt it. <laughs> so, like, if I have to vote, I want you to go and attack that one. Yeah, no, I will. You you know within the first five minutes uh, of the resolution committee meeting if a resolution gets pulled for discussion. So you know right away. So it's not a wait-and-see type of thing. And then they usually vote on those kind of as a slate and then they focus on the ones that need discussion. So personally, I'd like you to prepare your 20 seconds of something extremely impactful and that's why I had to write down my thoughts because I had so many negative ones that I had to put down the top things that yeah. I wanted to say. I, well, I, I will see you guys all Friday. So the meeting is until Saturday. So we'll have a chance. I'll have I'll, I'll make sure I meet with each one of you individually and and uh, you can let me know how you feel about what I put together. Okay. Sure, you could just email them to you. Oh yeah, email okay. me. If, if there's something specifically you want me to say or a sentence, yeah, shoot me an email. <laughs> and just I think we heard from enough of our constituents, you know, of, of, of our com community, um, community personnel, how they feel about this. So, yep. um, an yeah, if you want to individually share. send me just an email, obviously don't copy the board, um, but send me you know, what you'd like me to say, and then I'll come put that all together. Okay. okay, I think we're ready to move on. Next action item is the approval of the 2018-2022 IPCA contract. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Can you read the whole thing, though, okay. please? Thank you. Um, you I move to approve. <laughs> That is too long. I can't. The 2018-2019 <laughs> IPCA contract. Thank you, Justin. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Somebody else read it. Yeah, I, I can't. I, can't. I move that the Board of Education <laughs> approve the four-year negotiated agreement between the IPCA and the Indian Prairie School District Board of Education. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Gentlemen. It's sorry, past nine Mr. already. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> the Indian Prairie Classified Association, also known as IPCA, represents our classified staff. There are over 700 employees covered by this proposed and negotiated agreement, and they make up close to 25% of our workforce. Uh, the agreement that you have before you is the result of a long process that uh, began more than a year ago uh, in talks with the board prior to formal 
uh, negotiations with IPCA. We were directed to focus on the obvious financial aspects of living within our means, but also to look for, uh, toward aligning our contract dollars in a manner that best supports students. Um, retaining and recruiting uh, quality workforce was a key focus. Um, as we have found ourselves, just as we were in our other contracts, to be less competitive uh, over the last uh, 10 years. Um, the goal has been increasingly difficult to attain, uh, as in uh, educational funding has become less predictable. The administration does feel that the financial aspects of this contract is a step in the right direction while still sustaining a positive financial outlook. Uh, we uh, formally began negotiating in March of 2018. We met for more than 10 sessions of bargaining. We reached a tentative agreement on October 25th. The result is a four-year agreement that is before you. Uh, this contract calls for an increase in new money for salaries of 3.21% for this school year, 3.94 for the 1920 school year, 3.59 for the 2021 school year, and 3.68% for the 21-22 school year. The salary changes include base salary increases and STEP combined. The contract inc includes annual savings from changes to benefits. The contract also includes language that may change the terms or terminate the, terminate the contract in the final two years if the district experiences significant financial changes due to legislative uh, financial changes from the state. On behalf of the administrative team and the Board of Education, I'd like to thank Lisa Ramos, IPCA president, and the entire IPCA bargaining team for their hard work uh, dedication and commitment to the district and the bargaining process. And uh, the IPCA membership ratified this agreement today, uh, November 12, 2018. And at this time, uh, the administration recommends the Board of Education approve the Indian Prairie Classified Association negotiated agreement as presented. Questions, comments? Good job, team. Yeah, thanks. D did you say the vote again? Did the vote numbers? Uh, oh. um, I'm are trying to get sure? it official, okay. it w it's a it's a high percentage. I would it's over eighty percent uh, voted yes on the contract. Kind of flipped from our last ratification vote. Good job. Thank you to both teams. We're ready for a roll call. Mm -hmm. Jackie, please call the roll. Mr. Carubas. Yes. Miss Donahue. Aye. Miss Grover. Yes. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Ms. Peel? Aye. Ms. Deming? Aye. Mr. Rising? Aye. Motion passes. We now move to the tentative 2018 tax levy. I need a motion that the Board of Education approve the tentative 2018 tax levy. I move for the approval of the tentative 2018 tax levy. Board policy 410. Fiscal and business management for 30 revenue and investments, 484 taxing and borrowing authority limitations. I have a motion. I have a second. 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 <laughs> Do we have a motion and a second? Mr. String. Uh, good evening, board members. Uh, tonight's the first step in the process that ultimately will result in the extension of our property tax levy. Uh, to give you a little context, uh, we just had a governor's election and the focus of that was school funding and we'll have a new governor coming into office and uh, we'll hopefully continue to focus on school funding. Uh, we're in the second year of evidence-based funding formula, which to date improved our position over the previous foundation formula for funding public education. The evidence-based funding model identifies 27 research-based elements that positively impact student achievement. The expectation is that school districts will begin to implement these elements and the model is designed that every school district will have adequate funds available to implement all 27 elements within the next eight years. At the present time, Indian Prairie School District 204 is 80% funded. In other words, we are, we are $78 million short of implementing all of those 27 elements. A number of our comparable districts are funded over 100%. Last year, we finalized a year-long project uh, to engage our community to identify a list of prioritized needs throughout the district. Through this Engage 204 process, eight areas of recommendation were identified for continued improvement. In the coming year, we will continue to address those identified needs. So there is needs within the district. The Illinois School Code gives the authority of the Board of Education to levy taxes on real property within the district to support the public education and the schools. This process is annual and must end by the end of December. 
Furthermore, the truth and taxation law provides that the tenth of levy exceeds 105% of the previous year's extension. A public notice and hearing is needed for the official levy to be adopted. Since our levy request represents less than 5%, we are not subject to the truth and taxation law this year. We still intend to follow that law. Therefore, 20 days prior to the adoption of this levy, the school board must estimate and announce the tentative levy in the amount of money that it deems necessary to be raised by property taxes. This is the tentative levy that we're asking you to approve tonight. We are recommending that the board set a tentative levy in the amount of $300,965,590, which includes our bond and interest levy. It's important to note that this is simply a request. This is not what we will receive. While it represents a 4.1% increase over the 2000 le 2017 levy extension, the district is taxed by the CPI, which is 2.1%. We will not receive a 4.1% increase. In fact, depending upon the amount of new property in the district, we should experience an increase of approximately 3.6% over last year's extension. It's important to note that the levy calls for a bond and interest tax levy of $26,985,694. That's the estimated ending bond and interest levy in accordance with our bonded debt structure and will pay off this year's uh, bonds towards schools. Over the past 27 years, the property tax cap has faithfully limited property taxes in the collar counties to CPI and it continues to do so. The consumer price index for this tax cap was 2.1%. The district will therefore receive 2.1% increase plus the amount of new growth. With the tax cap, CPI has become the critical factor and not the tax rate. The rate is simply lowered or raised by the formula to obtain the CPI cap. Tax rates for this year will drop in both counties as property values have increased. DuPage County property values have increased by 3.94% and Will County property values have increased by 2.15%. For the 2018 taxes, the average homeowner should experience a 2.1% increase paid to the 204, the amount of CPI. The levy is set an amount that assures the district will be able to access the property of tax revenue of all new property. That's why we ask for more. The levy is based on the fiscal year 2020 budget forecast. As I mentioned earlier, current projections for the fiscal year 2020 suggest increased needs as identified by Engage 204 and the implementation of evidence-based funding elements. The estimated increases in property tax proceeds for the district, the new money that we will receive will be $9.5 million, of which $4 million will come from new construction or new property in the district. Although we are not subject to the truth and taxation law this year, we are still intending to go through that process and having a public hearing uh, before the board's adoption. The hearing will occur at the beginning of the December 10th board meeting. Later in that agenda, we'll ask the board for final approval. So at this time, the administration recommends that the board adopt the 2018 tentative levy as presented. Questions, comments? Hearing none, Jackie, call the roll. Ms. Deming? Aye. Ms. Peel? Aye. Mr. Rising? Aye. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Mr. Karubas? Yes. Ms. Grover? Aye. Motion passes. We move to our next and last action item, which is the approval from the Board of Education um, for our newest board member, Natasha Grover. We need to approve her expenses. Expenses need to be made public and approved by the Board of Education prior to a person going to a conference. Um, it's state law. Since the <laughs> conference is Friday, it's a good thing we're doing this right now <laughs> in order that Natasha can join us. So I need a motion that the Board of Education approve um, uh, yeah, I'll just the estimated it. travel expenses for Natasha Grover for the conference. I'll make a motion that the Board of Education approve the Board of Education IASB IASA IASBO 2018 annual conference estimated travel expenses for Natasha Grover as pre presented. Second. I have a motion and second. 
<laughs> Any discussion? If anybody opposes this. <laughs> 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 like once is free weekend. That's right. <laughs> this is your chance, Natasha. <laughs> he hearing none. <laughs> Jackie, call the roll. Mr. Rising. Aye. Ms. Deming? Aye. Ms. Grover? Aye. <laughs> Mr. Carubas? Yes. Mr. Raysack? Aye. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Ms. Peel? Aye. Motion passes. We now come to the discussion portion of our agenda. And the first topic of discussion is property tax relief grant application. Good evening again, board members. Um, through the legislative process that brought us the evidence-based funding, uh, there was a trailer bill, Public Act 100-582, which was a follow-up legislation which reserved $50 million for property tax relief. Of the $350 million that was allocated for fiscal year 2019 towards evidence-based funding, $50 million was pulled aside for property tax relief. I'd like to go through a little bit of the process. Applicants for the grant are available online and due January 7th, 2019 at 4 p.m. Districts that are eligible for the grant will be notified by ISB on January 31st. Um, it's important to note that almost every district in the state is eligible for the grant. <laughs> uh, if we are eligible, we will need to submit the abatement resolution to the county clerks in both DuPage and Will counties by March 30th. The county clerks will provide us with a certificate of abatement by April 15th, and the grants will be awarded to districts um, by May 20th. The threshold for, threshold for who receives the grant will be determined once all of the applications are received. So if, if people don't apply, there's a stronger chance that we'll receive the grant. Grants will be distributed to applicants' uh, districts beginning with the districts with the highest tax rates followed by the next highest until the $50 million is distributed. Any remaining funds will be put back into the evidence-based funding formula and go through the tier system, tier one, two, three, or four. Um, I want to put the grant into perspective. So the $50 million that are set aside, Indian Prairie School District 204 um, is eligible for $50.4 million. <laughs> <laughs> there are 286 districts that have a greater need than us, and based on their tax rates, those 286 districts represent $1.1 billion worth of possible tax relief. <laughs> we will be submitting this grant and hoping that several districts with greater need don't. <laughs> This grant is a long shot, but Indian Prairie School District has a history of being fiscally responsible, and we need to take advantage of this opportunity. So there's a $1.1 billion need, and they're coughing up $50 million. There's a $3.2 billion need, but there's a $1.1 billion ahead, ahead of, us. of us. So when the state doesn't have money, they issue grants. <laughs> I'm glad that we're applying. <laughs> Good it shows fiscal responsibility. Good use of resources. Never hurts to try. There is a chance. I'd put that on the low probability side as well. Thank I think, you. I think Dr. Sullivan, instead of a book, should have given us a rabbit's <laughs> foot and a, horse, <laughs> and a horseshoe. The, yeah, a four sign each of clover, us a portion. <laughs> sign each of us a portion of the grant to have to do. It sounds like the chances of getting money back on those class action suits that you get. <laughs> <laughs> 401k. Um, <laughs> Not happening. Dr. Sullivan has signed the grant, and I believe the board secretary needs to, and then I'll submit it tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, finally the, so sorry. the portion that I'm really looking forward <laughs> to <laughs> is our discussion and preschool update. Is it, is it a little lighter? And <laughs> <laughs> you can sit wherever you like. Go ahead. I'm just going to drive the computer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Before we begin, I just want to make sure we follow protocol. Would you like questions? Because we're a chatty group. <laughs> As the, uh, as the presentation is ongoing, or would you like it at the end? Either way, I think works for us. We're happy to answer whatever questions that you have. So whatever's right. most comfortable for Thank you. Thank you. I just want to follow our norms. Sometimes it's easier when it's right in the middle. So. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Thank you for the opportunity tonight to talk with you about our wonderful Prairie Children Preschool. Um, I'm here um, representing both Laura Johnston and Christina Sepiel, who also work with the preschool. There's only so much room at the table, so I uh, got hmm. the big straw so that I could be here tonight to celebrate with you. I'm going to let everyone else um, introduce themselves. Would you like to start? My name is Tracy Rico, and I'm a speech pathologist at the preschool. I'm Christine Black, and I'm a teacher at the preschool. What room? I'm the pony room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sally Osborne, and I'm the principal at the preschool. And Jen Newport, the instructional specialist on special assignment. That's what we, de <laughs> that's what we decided tonight Sounds was important. her title. <laughs> Well, moving on, um, the purpose of tonight's presentation is to share the wonderful opportunities provided to students at our Prairie Children Preschool. Um, this does coincide with um, board policies 6120 and 6170 as our preschool does uh, work with students, children with disabilities as well as students designated Title I. Um, first off, I really would like to take a few minutes to celebrate and con congratulate the staff at Prairie Children Preschool on earning the Accelerate Gold Circle of Quality. <laughs> the Gold Circle of Quality is recognized by the state as meeting or exceeding quality benchmark standards in the areas of learning environment, instructional quality, and program administration. You may ask yourself, why Prairie Children Preschool? So I'm here to tell you a couple of things. I'd like to highlight a couple of things. Um, the first thing is high quality staff. Um, our staff, all staff hold a professional educator license, our license is in their field. Um, we are able to provide a high quality early childhood education to all the children in our community, but we're really most excited about we're able to provide preschool to those children and those families who might not otherwise be able to afford it through a grant program. And then I think lastly, one of the whys is because we're part of the Indian Prairie School District, we're really able to work with our counterparts in the elementary to provide a smooth transition for our students as they move on to the kindergarten, on to kindergarten in the district. I always have to talk, I feel like I'm screaming in that. I always have to talk um, about staff because I don't, I don't know if people are aware that all our teachers at early, at the Prairie Children Preschool have multiple endorsements or approvals in terms of all of them have early childhood approvals or endorsement, early childhood special education, as well as many of our teachers have English as a second language as an endorsement or approval. I really just wanna talk uh, like a, a couple minutes about classrooms and students because I don't think people realize how large we are. Downstairs on the first floor we have 24 classrooms 24 classrooms of preschoolers, and we have four classrooms that are out located in the elementary schools. Um, I just listed up here some of the classrooms we have. We have inclusion classrooms, which are a combination of students who pay tuition and students who have individual education programs. Um, we have three Title I classrooms. Those are our classrooms that are located out at the elementary buildings. Um, we also have self-contained classrooms, which are our smaller classrooms for uh, all our students with IEPs are in in those classrooms. We have a bilingual classroom, and that's a classroom that's taught um, primarily in Spanish, 90% Spanish, 10% English. Um, and then we have a, phono, a phonological only classroom, which is one of our classrooms housed out at Graham Elementary, and those, that's for students who have significant speech articulation needs, and it's taught by a speech and language pathologist. Um, we have approximately 651 students enrolled at the preschool. All our, all our students are ages three to five. Um, we have, again, students who attend uh, and pay tuition. Students, we service all the students in the districts who have um, special needs and they have individual education programs. And then we service our students who are at risk through our grant programs. Um, so currently we serve 200 students who cannot afford the preschool experience. That's through our Title I classrooms. Those are at Longwood, Gombert, and McCarty. Um, we also have the preschool for all grant through the state of Illinois, and we serve 80 students that way. So altogether, we serve 200 students. We're really able to provide a variety of um, services to students in terms of we're able to provide transportation. We provide parent education to um, parents at the preschool. We provide assistance for school supplies, for snack, holiday assistance. We also provide summer school for students who are moving on to kindergarten in the fall. 
The last thing I want to mention is that we also do dental screenings, vision and hearing screenings. So there's a lot of things that we offer our at-risk students as well as our um, students in general who are attending the preschool. Our goal is really to provide a solid educational foundation for students and to close that achievement gap for our most at-risk students. This is one of my favorite slides because um, you will see that investment, $1 of investment in early childhood education gives you $7 in return. Um, so what that means is if you invest in early childhood now as a society, if you read all the way over to the end then, we're really gaining more capable, productive, and valuable citizens. That's our outcome. Money well spent. Money well spent, yes. Um, I talked a little bit ab about why period children preschool, but I think that one of the things we're able to do is really provide a smooth transition to elementary school. I just <coughs> wanted to highlight some of our instructional practices. So really we use a creative curriculum that's kind of our base. That's really, we use this, use this to um, help the teachers engineer their learning environment. Um, it's also about child initiative, child initiated choice um, during the day. Uh, we provide instruction in a large group, a small group, and one-to-one -one instruction within a structured daily routine. We also use an assessment called the Teaching Strategies Gold Assessment to really monitor students' learning throughout the school year. In addition to looking at academics, we also focus on social-emotional growth and development. We have a program called the PATHS program, um, promoting alternative thinking strategies, which really teaches students, among a lot of things, but how to solve um, problems when they're in a conflict situation. We also use positive behavior interventions and supports, so you'll hear all, everything we talk to our preschoolers about in, in positive manner, be ready, be, be respectful, and be safe. And then finally, we really wanted to highlight tonight, um, we have developed units of study based on the Illinois Early Learning and Development Standards to really ensure that our students are being provided high quality instruction within a developmental appropriate instructional framework. And to, uh, before our teachers uh, share with you, some of the specifics of those units of study. I want to give you a little bit of a background um, about the team in particular. If I were to have only, only three adjectives to describe the team, uh, the first one would be diverse. This was um, a team of 10 teachers. It's a, it was a large team and a very diverse team, each bringing a particular talent uh, to the table, ultimately uh, creating this, these units of study, seven of them, in a very collaborative manner with a great deal of effort, which brings me to my second adjective, which is generous. They were generous with their time, with their talents, with the writing, and then also with the implementation of these units of study, which began last year and continues with this in this year. And finally, professional, which is what you would expect for our teachers in this district. Um, their knowledge of their youngest students uh, in this district, uh, paired with their creative resources, really per, uh, produced this contextualized and dynamic unit of study approach to teaching. So when you hear about the units of study um, and it's being aligned to the understanding by design structure, we look at a framework for improving student achievement. And so a couple of things that I'd like to emphasize are these. What this structure does is emphasizes a teacher's critical role as a designer in student learning. They also, it, it helps teachers to clarify their learning goals, to devise relevant assessments of student understanding, and to craft effective and engaging learning activities. Students and um, their school performance, uh, student and school performance gains are achieved through regular review of results of their achievement end of their work, followed by targeted adjustments to the curriculum and instruction. In other words, we see through implementation, through teaching and instruction, how students are learning. We look at that and we determine if they've met that goal. If they haven't, we talk about it. If they have, we decide what to do next. Teachers also become more effective in the way that they seek feedback from their students and their peers, and they use that feedback, as I said, to adjust their teaching approaches. The implementation of uh, these units of study began last year, as I said, it's a team process. It rolled out with, um, with our institute days and also with building articulation days. It also continues in discussions and meeting as teams and professional learning communities within Prairie Children Preschool. 
and the teaching uh, leadership, the, the teachers that, that did write the curriculum, continue to support the teachers it, that are their peers um, through professional development as well. Now, our, uh, Christine and Tracy are going to share with you some of the specifics of each of our units of study. So we used um, a plan uh, A year and a B year because we do not have a first grade or a second grade curriculum. We have our students for two years at a time or more in our classrooms. As Sally had mentioned, we have three to five year olds. So we wanted to keep um, the learning interesting and relevant for those students. The same units throughout the building allow our students to learn in all the settings and from all our staff members. So for all of us doing the same units, you may think, well, it's not super exciting in our building. It's very exciting because it can carry over through every aspect of our day, from our motor room to our bus rooms to waiting in the hallways and talking to any of the students. Any staff member can mention something and they'll know what we're talking about. Um, as I uh, mentioned before, we follow the Illinois Early Learning and Development Standards, which are aligned to Common Core, which help with that transition into elementary. We um, explicitly selected standards at students at the beginning of the year that they would need, and as the units progressed, so did the standards progress. So for instance, in the beginning of the year, social-emotional is very strong. We want the students to learn about school. We want them to be comfortable with their peers. But as the year progresses and they're learning the curriculum for, and our units, we want to continue with those social-emotional standards. So by the end of the year, we want them to grow and to be able to talk about and do things more cooperatively and discuss feelings with their students. As you can see, that we um, decided that the beginning of our units would be all about me, which reigns from this year and it last year and carries over into this year. We chose this unit because they revolve around the student and their prior knowledge. It we, helps to differentiate for all our learners in our building for our beginning learners, all the way to our learners that have met those standards already. Our units of study um, also include all domains. So different from all other grades or other um, areas in the district, we cover every single domain in one unit of study. So we cover the social, emotional, physical, math, literacy, fine motor, gross motor, are all encompassed into one unit of study at a time. With the planning that we do for the units, we also select specific vocabulary and the target um, that we expose the, the children to through our teaching. Not just academic vocabulary, but vocabulary for teaching language skills, question words to teach how and to ask and answer questions, the social emotional vocabulary to expose and teach students how to convey their feelings, and vocabulary is part of our core communication skills so that we can teach all of our students how to use their language skills functionally across all academic areas with them. So as we said before, we had an A year and a B year. We kind of um, confused Atlas because they weren't really sure how to handle us because we're a lot different set up. Worked it out. Yeah, we worked it out. It's all we planned out now. Um, so we focused it on me. So we, you can look, we have me and my community, me on the go, engineering and me, and watch me grow. So me is a theme throughout all of last year. We started with the student itself because we want to start with what their prior knowledge is and what they know. We began with the, our classroom community, worked to our school community, and branched out and looked at the members of um, our community, from the mailman um, to your doctors in your community to the construction workers, which led us great into that transportation unit. What do the people of our community use to get around, and how do we get around in our community? One of our more exciting um, areas that we worked on was engineering and me. It allowed for our students to grow and learn in, the, in our STEM area and expand and um, create things out of plans that they made themselves. And then we watched, moved to Watch Me Grow, and that was a plant unit that we used to observe and to participate in actually planting and um, observing the gardens that, that we um, established in our classrooms. As we moved into the next units of study, we continued to link all of the units together by focusing on that me. Again, what we know about students and how they learn is if they can link their prior knowledge um, to something that they know, then they're a little bit more excited about learning, especially if they can recall on their prior knowledge with what they're continuing to learn about. 
Um, so in this B year unit, we're focusing those units on all about me, where students are going to learn about themselves, but also be able to use their language to describe their similarities and differences of themselves and others, as well as to be able to talk about their families and talk about their similarities and differences within their families. Moving on from that, we're going to be focusing on me and where I live. And this is where students will uh, be able to talk about their families and where they live, what types of homes they live in, but also where they are on the map. We have some great literature that we're using within our units of study, um, looking at where they live on the map, and then branching out further beyond the map um, to move into habitats and animals and where animals live. And finally, in our final unit, um, healthiest me I can be, which we know is something important for students to um, be able to understand how to take care of themselves, that living an active lifestyle is important. Uh, it's important to be safe and make good choices about what we eat and participating in physical activities, among all of that. Um, as part of our um, units of study, we also are very engaged in our PLCs within our, um, in our building. We meet two, sometimes more times a month, um, to discuss with our teachers in our PLCs about how things are going in all of our classrooms, um, what types of things are working, if things aren't working, if students aren't um, grasping a concept, what we can do differently um, in order to be able to help our students grasp that concept. Um, also to be able to get other ideas from other staff members, what they're doing, what kinds of things that they're doing that's working um, in their classrooms. Support staff in our building are also a really important part. As a speech pathologist and a support staff, we co-teach a lot of lessons within our classrooms. Um, we do a lot of language units, but also as a discipline, the speech pathologists get together to talk about um, different activities that we can do within the classroom that revolve around those units of study, different language concepts that we can teach in the classroom that revolve around those units of study. Our occupational therapists are also very involved um, with a lot of tasks that we can integrate into the classroom for fine motor activities. And our physical therapists do an amazing job of creating um, very detailed um, gross motor uh, multi-purpose room, the gross motor room, where they'll have large activities that um, completely integrate the vocabulary, different tasks. Kids walk along the balance beam and they might have to um, match different cars or transportation to different <coughs> things on the wall. So they do an excellent job of integrating our um, motor tasks within the curriculum as well. Here's just a few um, examples of how our units worked well together. You can see at the top there's a young man um, from the Pony Room, and he is now in kindergarten. He was working on a project. He designed his plan during our engineering unit. You can see his drawing, and he used the Lego materials to carry out his plan. We have on the bottom Tracy and Jenna doing a language activity based on a unit using our core board. And you can see some graphing in our multipurpose room in the corner of how it was set up to reflect um, activities for the unit we were doing. And then you can see a, um, somebody journaling, um, observing their plant that was growing. And Tracy's up there too. We took our cars out and had the students come out and look at the parts of our cars um, so that they knew one of some of our words. We were talking about steering wheels and the lights and the tires, so they got hands-on experience um, to look at our own vehicles that we pulled up. And I'm not sure if we have this pictured, but another really important piece that we do within our classroom is learning through, learning through <coughs> play. So oftentimes we set up our dramatic play centers. Um, last year they became flower shops. Um, when we've done a, a Healthiest Me unit, some of our dramatic play centers become a gym where the kids can pretend to come in and they're going to go to the gym and, um, you know, interact within a class, right, or, or a car wash. We'll turn a dramatic play center into a car wash and the kids will build cars and pretend to take the cars through the car wash. So another way that we integrate those units of study within that very important piece of play. Just a few more pictures to share with you the fun and exciting things that happen at our very own preschool. As we wrap up, I just want to thank also the staff that were here tonight in support of uh, this. Some, I think, were on the committee. Others um, came in support, and I think that says a lot that um, teachers not only on the group, the team that worked on this, but teachers that were on the team came in support of it to make sure that you knew how special this was. So with that being said, I'd like to thank everyone here and see if you have any questions for us. Questions, comments? How do you, what, how do you define at-risk students? At-risk for the, you want to? No, you go. 
uh, for the Title I grants and for uh, much of the preschool for all grants based on uh, low income. Okay. And then you want to talk about what happens after that? Well, there are also additional criteria through the state for the preschool for all, preschool for all grants. So we're really looking at um, children who are, would be considered at risk for academic failure. So when we do screening, their screening results are lower or considered in the at risk range compared to other children their age. Um, and again, they may come from a low income family. They may come a, from a family whose English English is not their primary language. They may come from a family who has a variety of medical needs in the background, a teen parent. There are a variety of at-risk factors that we look at, but income is probably the, one of the primary ones. So the preschool for all versus the um, Title I, they're, they're two different grants. Yes. And so you do an assessment as each child comes to so, the preschool? Yes, yeah, so every child that we have that comes through the preschool goes through a screening process. And based on the screening process, they're either age appropriate, they're considered at risk, or we may be looking at doing evaluation or actually bringing a child in for more of a face-to-face -face screening. Um, so we do most of our screenings um, by having parents fill out information and looking at developmental norms. And then one last question. Um, you mentioned the bi talked about the bilingual room. Is there, how do they transition? Do they, um, as far as English is concerned, do as they get ready to go to kindergarten? I'm, what's the? That's a great question. We we try to work closely with um, our feeder schools. We have a lot of our children are from Georgetown that are in that program, so they are transitioning into um, a program in kindergarten where they may also have their primary language. I think we just really try to work closely with whatever the feeder school is um, to make sure that we're transi transitioning them correctly and they're getting the services they need when they go on to kindergarten. Can I just clarify your question about preschool for all is state money? Yes. Title I is federal money. Okay. So they're two different right. pots of money. Thanks. So you mentioned there is a, a wait list for your, the at risk students. So can you just talk a little bit about like how many students are on a wait list and, and I mean I got your answer Kathy about the funding is it, so one pot of money cannot touch the other pot of money or, or else we don't get the funding. So can you kind of explain that a little bit? Right. So um, in, for the Title I grant and for grants it is um, based on providing what everyone gets, and then the Title I grant is for above and beyond. And so um, our, our students that are attending our preschool under the Title I grant are receiving a free <coughs> preschool opportunity. If we were to then slot them into another classroom that was not Title I um, then, and paid for them to be in the preschool, then it would be supplanting mm -hmm. instead of supporting. So it, it would be something that we did for all kids and then we wouldn't be able to use those Title I funds for that purpose. So it's, it's a, um, the purpose is to go on top of what everyone gets, and so that's um, part of the issue. It doesn't make a lot of sense because, yeah, because you would think you would want as many students <laughs> right. in For that as one possible. to $7 saving thing. Right, yeah. that, right, okay. right. Okay. But that's, that's um, how the, the rules follow. and. Um, so we have to and we have to be compliant in order to maintain the opportunity to provide that for the number of students that we do provide. We should write a resolution. Yeah, about probably. <laughs> probably. We could probably write six hundred million. Resolutions. What does that What does that wait list look like? Yeah. How long is that? Well, the, the there's wait list for Title One. We're always moving kids in and out depending on. Um, you know, that can be a, more of a transient population. So we're almost always having, I can't tell you the exact number right now, for preschool for all, they expect us to have all our slots filled by October 15th. So we are filled with our 80 slots. And we are almost completely filled with our 120 for Title I. So once they're filled, every, then the kids go on a wait list and we start looking at any movement um, for, for both of those groups of children. So when a student moves out, there's somebody there's right there. To, right. It's not like a hundred kids that are. There's you know, no. Yeah. There's not. Okay. And, and since they have to go through a screening process, we know all the kids that are coming in because we're we're continually screening.
pretty much daily, we're screening children. So we know who those children are, what their home elementary school is, what their needs are, what their at-risk um, background looks like. So we're able to quickly um, get children into spots that are open. I just want to say thanks. <laughs> um, as a dad of two previous Prairie Children Preschool kids, um, a long time ago, the first one started in 2001 and received services in the district. Both my kids had IEPs, so I'm familiar with the way it works. And and all I can say, well, maybe they had a good first leader too. Um, but uh, <laughs> you know that I, I'm always constantly amazed and, and impressed with with the preschool, just the way they work together so well as a team from all the therapists to the uh, assistants, the teacher's aides, the teachers. Um, uh, I'm partial to the snail room, but that's just me. But um, <laughs> sorry, no offense. <laughs> no offense to the pony room. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you're, you're, no you're, 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 <laughs> you're, I know, like people this. at home are like, what are you saying? Um, you know, the, the, now. the gold <laughs> circle of quality, I mean, just, well deserved i mean you guys just keep pushing the bar and doing amazing things and i just thanks for what you do for our kids thank you natasha anything um most of my questions were answered by kathy already okay great <laughs> um but i do want to say i appreciate all you do the teachers and everything and the developmental screening is so important so i i appreciate what you do for the parents for that so thank you. I had one, one last question. I said that before, but another question. <laughs> um, as we look at, obviously, the earlier that we can get students in makes such a big difference when we're talking about closing the um, achievement gap. Are there any, is there any way to know if we have families that are in the district that might be eligible to participate who don't know? Or, or how do we make sure that everyone knows? What, what do we, we have, do? Well, that's uh, one of the reasons why we started to put our Title I classes in the schools. Uh, Laura was at Longwood at the time we put the first one there because as a family comes to any event at Longwood, she could say, how old is that one? We have a preschool. Bring them to me. And so that has continued with um, the – we have two uh, classes at each one of those three Title I schools for that very reason because – it one it helps us recruit it helps to get the word out and also it, it's a nice transition for a family because a three-year-old can come to school with the third grader and that student knows their school before kindergarten even starts so it's just a, a very po it's been a very positive move to uh, place those classrooms within our title one buildings just a little anecdote. I went to kindergarten the welcome day for kindergarten and the, there was a family there who's child was going to go to preschool at Longwood and so they were very very excited about um, about that mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um, thanks. it's grown we started with one classroom and now we have six so up to 120 students so I have a couple comments and then a question um, my comment is I wish the world was like the yeah. Prairie, pre, the prairie <laughs> Preschool pro Program. It is a wonderfully inclusionary and culturally, racially, ability diverse group of little humans. It's a fun, <laughs> it's a fun little world down there. <laughs> and whenever I come to this building, and I come a lot, and you come in the morning or you come when dismissal, it's a very very happy place <laughs> <laughs> and people seem to get along <laughs> and people are smiling so the world needs to take <laughs> like a hint of what goes on down there whether it's the snails or the ponies <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so important that we have this program and, I, and I, I, I know funding and everything else complicates life but people need to understand and I know you do is that this kind of program pr 
provides a foundation mm -hmm. for what happens in the future. And people need to understand that the research shows by third grade, if our students are still behind, the likelihood of them being behind when they're a senior in high school mm -hmm. still exists. So this type of early preschool kind of education is critical to what happens to our children. And so uh, we need to keep on doing what we're doing. I wanna thank the staff, wonderful staff. Thanks for being here. Thanks for everything you do. Thanks for your smile on the face when they come off the bus and you're still smiling when you put them on. <laughs> <laughs> so I really appreciate all that. My question is, what kind of longitudinal da data do you take? Like, you know, you get a kid at three. I mean, do you keep track of what happens to them when they're in second and third grade and how they're progressing? Uh, we have been. Um, the, um, we just, Charles helped me with some data today. We looked at our students who were determined to be at risk uh, when they were three and as they were entering kindergarten, um, over 70% of them were no longer at risk based on their Ames Web fall benchmark data. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the most powerful pieces of data that we have. Uh, we continue to uh, see them what happens at first grade, second grade, and we'll continue to watch that as we move forward. We've concentrated on the Title I piece because those seem to be our neediest population, so we've been looking at those students as well um, as we uh, move through that. But we, you know, through Charles and his assessment team, they've done a nice job of being able to create a group for us to be able to watch uh, the progress of those students as they move throughout. So, so far the data has been positive, um, that it is making an impact. We knew that, but it's so nice to have the data to validate yeah, all the things that they're doing. Is there a mandate that we have preschool? For students with disabilities, yes. Oh, For disabilities, yes. yes. Yes, we have to service all students with um, special needs when they turn three. <laughs> the Title I piece is our choice. Um, you can use Title I funds for any group of uh, students that uh, based on low income, and we've chosen to uh, support our preschoolers uh, because of what you saw as far as investing a dollar and what that brings back to you. How long have we been? That's an unusual choice, though. There aren't it a is. lot of folks who spend some of their Title I dollars in preschool, mm -hmm. but we really think that that's an important place to put those dollars to try to get mm -hmm. at that a gap before. How long have we had, how long have we had it in place, the Title, Title I? Title I? Mm -hmm. um, this is, I believe, our fourth, fourth year. Okay. Yeah. Fourth? No. Fourth? No. Fifth? No. no. She's <laughs> Five, 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 six. Eight. Laura, you had your first one. Six. six years. Six years. Okay. It's, it's six seven years. years. It's seven. seven years. We started out with a half seven. section. Yeah. We had twenty <laughs> students when it's, we started. It's been a while. Other comments or questions? Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Board of Education update. Um, I think Justin and Susan may have a report on equity, belief statement, and or policy. Yeah, the, uh, the ball's moving forward on that work. Um, I've solicited uh, and received uh, some of our information on equity. Uh, I believe we individually have a large library and I'd like to catalog that um, so that we can make that available to all of us and future board members. Um, we're, Susan and I are kind of working on a, <clears throat> the parameters of a policy and uh, the wisdom of it being a policy or a statement. And uh, so the, the work progresses and uh, the next step is for kind of Susan and I to get together and put some parameters on it, uh, highs and lows. Uh, it, and then we're going to present it to the board for its kind of review and digest it, input. And then the plan is to uh, bring it out to stakeholders um, for their input as well. So uh, 
it's not a uh, easy button where we can get it done real quick and it shouldn't be but uh, we're moving forward and I, I will um, as Justin mentioned we both have some catalog of material so I will be reaching out uh, to um, I let me check my calendar <laughs> so I can determine what the best way is for us to ensure that we can make it available <laughs> for everyone I'll add that to my to-do list thank you Ms. Horvath <laughs> any questions uh, land meeting was held last Friday. Ralph Mateer, many people know, uh, talked about uh, pension funding. PowerPoint was pro provided. I will send that PowerPoint <coughs> in the next few days for you to look at. For those of you who are familiar with Mr. Mateer, um, he thinks he has a way of addressing uh, the pension funding crisis in the state. Basically, it's to re-amortize uh, everything borrow over a longer period of time. Borrow more money, too? Is that in there? Uh, I don't know. And so that was uh, the, the part of the presentation, so you can look at that. Um, I was not at that meeting. We were represented by Jay because my final comment is about I really want to thank the staffs and all the community members who participated in the Veterans Day ceremonies. Uh, those of us who were there, we're sort of blown away, actually. Um, and what we were blown away with is the message that was, that was presented to our students. Um, whether they were elementary students and very young kindergarten students, to or to high school students. And somehow, the school's programs and the community members who presented just gave students an idea of what service was and service to their community and service to their country. Um, every time I go, I learn something about service too. So they're really, really well done. I'm glad we have school that day because I think a lot of great teaching goes on during that time period that's very important to our kids. So I wanna thank our schools. I wanna thank all the community members who participated uh, because I think it makes a difference in the lives of our children. With that, do I, have a, to adjourn. do I have a second? <laughs> Good job, Kathy. Second. I'll approve. Say aye. 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 Need your. Oh, my gosh. Oh, she got to even stop right there. Oh, she got to even stop right at the oh. end.